Before we dive into today's build, just a quick heads up, there is currently a 50% discount running on CodeTrip Pro. You can use the coupon code in the description or head straight to the link to get half of your first billing period. That brings the early plan down to just $15. So if you have been thinking about joining Pro, now is probably the best time to do it. Alright, let's talk about today's video. Just a couple days ago, on November 19th, Awards featured this site as their site of the day. And as soon as the intro animation wraps, the landing page reveals a stunningly layered, scrolled reactive 3D slider. As you scroll, either up or down, the slides shift in 3D space while staying perfectly stacked. Scroll down, and the stack pushes backward. The next light comes into view, while the farthest one fades away. Scroll up, and it reverses. The previous light reappears at the back, while the one at the front is removed. All of it happens in this seamless, scroll powered sequence. You have probably seen similar 3D layouts on a lot of award winning sites, and while we have covered simpler versions of this in the past, this one felt like the right time to build a solid base version, something you can reuse in your own projects. So after spending a few hours exploring the effect, I put together this super minimal 3D slider. It recreates that same layered layout and focuses mainly on the core animation logic without any extra distractions. It works seamlessly with both scroll and touch, so whether you are on desktop or mobile, it should behave consistently across all devices. In this video, I'll walk you through how the whole thing comes together, from the layout structure to the animation logic and how both scroll and touch inputs drive the slider interaction. If you find these kinds of rebels helpful, make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to access the source code for this project, along with hundreds of other similar micro projects and a brand new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's jump into the code. First of all, we'll start by setting up the basic page layout. I'll create a nav element at the top. This will hold three main blocks, a logo on the left, some nav links in the center and a call to action button on the right. For now, all of these can use simple placeholder links. We are just giving the page some structure before we dive into the animation logic. Next, we'll add a footer at the bottom. This won't be part of the slider itself. It's just there to ground the layout visually and add a bit of polish. Now below that, I'll add a main container. This container div will stretch across the full viewport and act as the outer wrapper for our slider. And inside the container, we'll drop in a single empty div with the class slider. This is where we'll place all the individual slides, but instead of hard coding them, we'll generate them dynamically using JavaScript in the next section. Alright, that takes care of the initial structure. Let's move on to the styling. First of all, I'm importing two fonts from Google Fonts. We'll use just mono for all the UI elements like the nav and footer, and enter for the large heading text inside the slides. Next, I'll set up a few root color variables. This just makes it easier to keep the palette consistent across the layout. We have got a few shades of dark plus one accent color that we'll use for the logo button. Then, I'll reset the spacing across the board, removing default margins and paddings, and set everything to use border box sizing. Now for the body, we'll set the primary font to just mono to match the editorial minimal aesthetic. Then, we'll style the anchor and paragraph tags, both use uppercase text slightly condensed letter spacing and a smaller font size to keep things tight and compact. This applies to all the navigation items and the footer copy. Now let's move on to the nav bar. We'll fix it to the top of the page and use flex layout to arrange the logo, links and CTA side by side. There is a little spacing between items and the CTA button is pushed all the way to the right. Each nav link is styled as a compact capsule with a dark background, light border, and some padding. The logo uses the accent color instead, with no border and slightly heavier weight just to make it pop visually from the rest of the links. Next, I'll style the footer. Just like the nav, it's fixed, but this time to the bottom of the screen. It also uses flex to align two pieces of text side by side, one on the left, one on the right, just to balance the layout. Now let's move into the main layout. The container takes up the full viewport and uses a dark background to help the slider area stand out for now. We'll also hide overflow here since we are going to animate slides in and out later. Inside the container, we have got the slider div. This is the key wrapper for the entire animation. It's absolutely positioned and fills the full screen, but more importantly, we are giving it a perspective. 
This lets us create a 3D space where each slide can be pushed forward and backward along the z-axis. We have also shifted the perspective origin slightly to make the depth effect feel more grounded toward the bottom of the screen. Now let's style the individual slides. Each slide is positioned at the center of the screen using a 3D translate for now. They have a fixed height, a bit of border radius, and are styled as flex containers, so we can easily center the heading text inside. We have also added build change for transform and opacity. This helps with performance during animation. Inside each slide, we have got two elements, an image and a title. The image stretches to cover the entire slide area and uses object fit cover so it scales nicely without getting distorted. Then there is the title, styled as a large bold heading using the inter font. It uses the tight letter spacing to give it that clean editorial feel. Now the words inside the title will be split using GSAP split text plugin. So we'll add a class to each word. The word class has will change transform as well because we'll be animating each word individually as part of the transition. Finally, I'll add a few quick responsive tweaks for smaller screens. When the viewport is narrow, we'll hide the nav links to keep things uncluttered. The slide width and title size also scale down proportionally just to make sure everything still feels balanced on mobile. And that wraps up the course styling. Next, we'll jump into the JavaScript and set up the logic that controls how each slide gets created, animated, and triggered by scroll or touch. First of all, we'll start by importing GSAP, that's the animation library we'll use to animate our slides, titles, and transitions. Right after that, we are also importing a GSAP plugin called Split Text. The reason we need Split Text is because it allows us to break a text element into smaller pieces like individual words or even characters. Once both are imported, we register the Split Text plugin with GSAP. This step is important. It tells GSAP that we want to use the plugin in our animations later on. Next, we'll create a simple data array that contains all the content we want in the slider. Each item in this array is a single slide. It has two pieces of information, a title and an image path, which we'll use as the background image for that particular slide. By storing all of this in a JavaScript array, we keep our layout dynamic and flexible. It means we can generate the slides automatically without writing any of them manually in the HTML. Now that we have our data, we need to target the main elements in our layout. First, we select the container. This is the full screen wrapper that holds everything. Then inside that, we select the slider div. This is where we'll dynamically insert our slides. After that, I'll define two variables that will help us control the behavior of the slider. The first variable is used to track which slide is currently sitting at the front of this tag. We'll update this index as we scroll forward or backward, so we always know where we are in the sequence. The second variable acts as a lock. It prevents the slider animation from triggering again while the previous animation is still in progress. Without this, if the user scrolls too quickly or swipes too often, we could run into glitches or broken transitions. So this lock helps us keep everything stable and smooth. Now I'll define a function called initialize slider. This function does three things. It builds all the slides from the data. It splits the titles into words using split text and it positions each slide in 3D space so they form a vertical stack. First, we loop through the slide data array. For every slide, we create a new div and assign it the class slide. Inside that, we insert an image element and a title heading. This image will act as the background and the title will be animated later using split text. Once that's done, we append the slide to the slider container in the DOM. At this point, we have created all the slides and they are sitting inside the slider, but they would be still just static elements. So next, we select all the slide elements that we just added and we loop through them again. This time, we are focusing on the title heading inside each slide. For every title, we apply split text and set it to split the text by words. We also enable masking. This prepares the text for animation, allowing us to reveal each word individually later in the timeline. Once the text is split, we loop through all the slides one more time, and this time, we position them using GSAP. Each slide is offset on the y-axis, so it appears slightly higher or lower than the others. And it's also pushed back in depth using the z-axis. The amount of depth increases with the index, so the first slide is closest to us, and the rest are progressively pushed further back. This is what creates that 3D stack layout. Finally, we make sure this entire setup runs only after the page is fully loaded. We do that by listening for DOM content loaded event. Once the DOM is ready, we call our initialize slider function and that builds and positions all the slides fully ready for interaction. And that wraps up the initialization phase. Now that we have built and positioned all the slides, the next step is to respond to user input, specifically for scroll or swipe, and trigger our slide transitions. We'll start by handling mouse or trackpad scroll. First, I'll create a variable to track scroll momentum. We'll call it a wheel accumulator. 
Every time the user scrolls, even slightly, we'll add the amount of scroll movement to this variable. The reason we are doing this is because wheel events fire continuously and in small increments, even when the user barely moves the scroll wheel or trackpad. If we triggered the slider on every movement, the transitions would stutter or stack too quickly. So instead, we accumulate the scroll movement and wait until it crosses a threshold before triggering anything. I'll also define a variable for that scroll threshold, just a smaller number that tells us how much scrolling is enough to count as a real gesture. Then we'll create a lock called easeWheel active. This flag helps us debounce the scroll input. Basically, we want to temporarily ignore new input for a second or so after each animation is triggered. This avoids overlap and keeps things smooth. Now we add a wheel event listener to the container. That's the full screen section holding the slider. This event runs every time the user scrolls with a mouse or trackpad. Inside the event handler, the first thing we do is prevent the default browser scroll behavior. That's because we are taking full control of the scroll input. We don't want the page to actually move. Next, we check two things. First, if the slider is currently animating and second, if a scroll was already recently triggered and is still in the cooldown period. If either one is true, we return early and skip the rest. You don't want to fire animations multiple times back to back. If we are clear to proceed, we grab the amount of scroll movement from the event and add it to our wheel accumulator. We take the absolute value here. That means we don't care whether the scroll is up or down at this point. We are just tracking how much movement is happening. Then we check if the accumulated value has passed our threshold. If it has, we consider this as a valid scroll gesture. At this point, we lock the scroll handler so no more input gets through for the next moment or so. We also reset the accumulator to zero so the next gesture starts fresh. Then we detect the scroll direction. If the scroll delta is greater than zero, that means the user is scrolling down, otherwise it's scrolling up. We store this as a direction variable which will pass into our animation logic next. Now, we call the function that handles the slide change, we'll pass the direction we just calculated so the slider knows which way to animate. Finally, we set a short timeout around 1200 milliseconds and once that time is up, we reset the scroll lock. That gives the animation time to finish before another scroll gesture is allowed. That completes the logic for wheel input. Now let's do the same for touch so that our slider works just as well on mobile devices or tablets. First, I'll define two variables to track where the touch begins, one for the vertical position and one for the horizontal. We'll use this later to calculate the swipe direction. We also define a lock for touch input and a separate swipe threshold. This tells us how far the user needs to swipe before we consider it as a proper interaction. Then we add a touch start event listener on the container. When the user touches the screen, we right away store the starting X and Y positions of that touch. Just like before, we also check whether an animation is already running or if the touch lock is active and if so, we ignore the touch. Next, we add a touch end event. This is fired when the user lifts their finger from the screen. Inside this event, we compare the start position to the final position. We calculate the vertical distance that tells us how far the user swiped up or down. And we also calculate the horizontal distance which helps us determine whether this was more of a vertical gesture or a side swipe. If the vertical movement is greater than the horizontal and if it passes our defined threshold, we treat it as a scroll-like swipe. Once again, we lock the input to avoid double triggers and we calculate the swipe direction based on the vertical movement. If the user swiped upward, that's a scroll down gesture. If they swipe downward, we treat it as a scroll up. We call the same slide change function we used for the wheel input, passing in the direction we just calculated. And finally, we set a short delay before unlocking touch input again, just like we did for scroll. This ensures that the animation has time to finish before any new gestures are allowed. At the end of this section, we have a shared handler function that receives the scroll direction either up or down. Before doing anything, the function checks one more time if an animation is already active and if so, it exits early. Otherwise, it locks the animation and calls the appropriate handler depending on the direction. If the direction is down, we trigger the scroll down logic. If it's up, we trigger the scroll up logic. And that wraps up the entire scroll and touch detection phase. This part of the code doesn't animate anything visually, but it forms the foundation of how user interaction drives the slider. Now that we have captured gestures and passed the direction to our logic, we are ready to animate the actual slides next. Let's walk through how the slider actually responds, starting with the scroll down animation. We'll begin by selecting all the existing slides in the DOM and storing a reference to the one currently at the front of the stack. Then we update our index tracker. We increment the front slide index by one to point to the next slide in line. And since our slides loop endlessly, we also make sure that index wraps around using the module operator so it always stays within the array length. Now we calculate which slide should appear 
This is the new one we are about to add. We take the updated index and offset it by 4 because the slider stack holds 5 slides at any time. Again, we use modulo to wrap around if needed. Next, we create a brand new slide element. This new slide will contain the image and the title data we just pulled from the array. We assign it the slide class and inject the necessary markup inside that includes a full background image and a title heading. Once the new slide is created, we find the heading inside it and apply split text, splitting the title into individual words and masking them. This sets up the animation will run in a moment. Now before the slide is visible, we set all of its words to be fully offset vertically using Y%. This ensures that the words start out of view and will animate upward into place later. Then we append the new slide to the bottom of the slider. Immediately after that, we position the slide in 3D space by giving it the furthest Z depth. We also position it slightly lower on the Y axis and set its opacity to 0. At this point, it's fully inserted into the layout but not yet visible. It's just waiting to be animated forward. Next, we grab all the slides again including the one we just added. We loop through each of them and update their position. We shift every slide forward by one position, both in depth and in vertical placement. The slide that was at the front moves out of the visible range, its index drops below zero, its opacity fades out, and it moves slightly upward. All of the other slides follow. Once all the slides are repositioned, we add a small delay and then animate the words of the new slide into view. Each word animates upward from below using a smooth easing curve and a slight stagger between words. This creates a flowing reveal as the slide becomes visible. And finally, when the animation is complete, we remove the first slide, the one that just faded out. We also release the animation lock so that the slider is ready to respond to the next scroll input or touch input. Now let's look at the scroll up logic. It's almost the same but in reverse. We start by selecting all the current slides and grabbing the last one. This slide will be removed at the end of the animation. Then we update the front slide index again. This time, we decrement it by 1 to go backwards. And just like before, we wrap the index using modulo to make sure it stays within the range. Now we find the slide that should appear again, the one we are going to bring back into view. We create a new slide element, inject the correct image and title and apply split text to the heading inside. This prepares the words for animation. Next, we insert this new slide at the very beginning of the slider. We position it one step in front of the current front slide using the negative Z depth to move it slightly forward. We also shift it downward slightly and set its opacity to zero. This makes it invisible and off screen. Then we grab all the current slides including the new one and loop through them. We update the position of every slide. The new slide comes forward. Once the animation is complete, we remove the last slide, the one that just moved out of view, and we reset the animation lock so that everything is ready for the next gesture, and that completes both scroll directions. This two-way motion creates a seamless scroll-powered slider with animated depth, title transitions, and dynamic stacking all built using GSAP, split text, and a simple dataset. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.